Welcome to the Humans vs. Retirement podcast with me, Dan Haylett. This show will help you navigate the intricate financial and non-financial landscape of retirement planning, investment and income strategies, and the human experience beyond the traditional work-life paradigm. Join me as I delve into the challenges, triumphs, and unexpected journeys individuals face as they transition into this new phase of life. From experts across many different areas to personal stories, we uncover the secrets, insights, and practical tips to empower you on your retirement journey. Whether you're just starting to consider retirement or already enjoying this chapter, this podcast is your guide to making the most out of this remarkable phase of life. Now, on to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Humans vs. Retirement podcast. I'm your host, Dan Haylett. Today's conversation is with life transition coach, Suzanne Campai. Now, Susie is a certified co-active coach and has made it her mission to understand the process of personal and professional transitions and the challenges that come with them. She is so passionate about working with clients to help them see through and make a pathway for the life they want to experience. In our conversation, Susie encourages people planning for or already living in retirement to step back and reflect on who they are and what they truly enjoy, as well as the significance of having a positive attitude and choosing to thrive in retirement. We discussed the differences between men and women in retirement, particularly in terms of social connections and expectations, whilst also exploring why communication and setting expectations are crucial for couples transitioning into retirement. In Susie's opinion, retirement is a multifaceted life transition that requires deep introspection and consideration of various aspects of life. Her retirement wheel is a tool that helps individuals visualize and address different areas of their life, including spiritual well being, family and friends, partnership and love, health and fitness, and fun play and travel. A free download of this will be available in the show notes. And finally, Susie talks about why she believes it is important to approach retirement with curiosity and a sense of wonder, remaining open to new experiences and learning opportunities, and how retirement should not be seen as the finish line, but rather as a new beginning that requires ongoing adaptation and planning. So without any further delay, let's get to my conversation with Suzanne Campai. Susan Campy, a very warm welcome to the Humans versus Retirement podcast. Thank you so much, Dan. I am so honored to be here. Uh, Susan, I can't wait to have this uh, conversation with you. We had, we've had some back and forth on social media. We had a Zoom call a couple of weeks ago where we talked about mapping out this conversation. So uh, thrilled to have you here and I can't wait to, uh, to, to have this conversation. Before I get to you introducing yourself and a bit about your journey, I want to let the listeners know, and I'll put links onto your great website and the services that, 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 that you offer as, as a coach. Um, but your bio on your website, it, I think, is fantastic. Um, and I'm going to read it word for word. And hopefully that intros you in to, to tell us a bit more about how you uh, got to, to where you are now. Um, I coach people going through a big life change on how to use their transition as the spark to create the life they want, one driven by purpose and meaning from finding a fulfilling career to managing any of our life's many evolutions. Now, if that doesn't speak directly to kind of the work that I do with retirees and the listeners, then I don't know what. So I'm thrilled to have this conversation. Tell me a bit more how you um, how you become um, the, the coach that you are now, and 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 how you become and how you started to do the work that that you do. I've had a diverse career. I started out in real estate sales when the kids were little, and spent many years in high tech recruiting here in Silicon Valley for software companies. So as well as owning and operating a fitness studio, and that was a a bit ago, about 10 years ago, that I owned and operated a fitness studio that specialized in baby boomers and their parents. And back then, uh, there were more baby boomers 
had parents, but I was a wee one in my late forties at the time. And that was a fabulous experience. And then coaching has been calling my name. You know, I coached throughout the time I was a recruiter. I coached throughout the time I owned my fitness studio. And then life coaching started to really hit me as something I wanted to do. So in my business, I work closely with people during their big transitions in life. I love the transitions topic. And most often that involves retirement in all of its phases, actually. With I'm without the emphasis on finance. So that's where I hand them to you, Dan. And uh, at my age of over 60 now, the conversation is out there with all of my peers. We cannot get together for a meal without people talking about retirement. When are you going to retire? They, they pretty much know that they're fine financially, but they're worried about the social aspects, the being home alone with the spouse. They're worried about what they're going to do with their time. So I noticed that that conversation was happening with a mix of kind of wide-eyed wonder and wide-eyed panic all at the same time. So this led me to really to head down this path of retirement and study the heck out of it. So, you know, Dan, I always, I have to admit that I always thought people just retired. And I know you've talked about that a lot. You know, our parents quit working one day. My dad just stopped retiring and that was it. And now it's my peers and I'm watching this really intimately. So I see that this phase of life is just so much more. Yeah. So I have I've had uh, people reach out to me when they're considering retirement or even much after they retired because they want to I call it a retirement reset. So they have uh, done a lot of things. They've done travel and now they really want to repurpose themselves. They want to work through some mission and pur purpose work and kind of take a look again. So um, you and I actually talked about, and I totally agree, the word retirement's gotten old. So I love repurpose. I love helping people to repurpose. So um, I think you kind of agree with that one. I mean, we can, we can assume, you know, if we're retiring at 62, 65, we could have a lot of years left. So I feel like boomers are retiring differently than their parents did. My dad was very happy to purchase a recliner and hang around the house. And then my mom worked all, all her life raising eight kids. So she was hoping to travel a lot and they didn't really align. But kind of the bottom line there is we don't have role models as boomers. Our parents lived a very different life. They're doing it very differently, especially women for the most part. I know my mom was a stay at home mom. Me and my sisters worked so we don't really have role models, so we're kind of charting our own territory. So we're, you know, we're building this new phase of life and we're repurposing, we're reinventing, we're rebooting, we're recharging, and we're re recharting new territory. So it's exciting. I really want to be instrumental in helping people put a festive spin on this part of life. I mean, whether you call it a third quarter, a third act, fourth quarter, fourth quarter, whatever, but creating a bit of order to their chaos. This is my passion. I think repurposing, um, Susan, is, is a really interesting way, though, to, to think about this. And I just want to, and, and I know you've explained quite a bit about that, but I just want to hang on it for a minute because re retirement is an outdated concept. The word I don't think resonates with many people anymore, but it, it is ingrained in so many as, a, as, as kind of this thing. Um, but actually the mindset that people have to get themselves into to think, well, this is a chance to, this is a chance to repurpose what life means. And, and as you said there, what, what, you know, the, the bio that you've got that create the spark um, to, to, to actually kind of live the life that they want the word repurpose i think helps create that repurposing so we can explore what it means how we approach that kind of third act um have you got any tips for, for people and, and and kind of you know you've obviously coached people through this about how they can start to rewire this to kind of think well actually no this isn't a retirement this is a chance to repurpose life. Mm. Yeah, Dan, you know what? I, I really urge people to take a look at, step back and take a look at who they are. Step back and they've been a human doing for 45, 50 years. Who, who are they really? 
and I was going to talk about this later in our conversation, but they have been on such a treadmill and, you know, especially if they've raised families at the same times, it's just been go, go, go. And I, I think I feel that they've been human doings and not really human beings. So we have some exercises and we have a lot of conversation about stepping back and taking a look at who they are. I mean, even as far as what did they like to do when they were a kid? I have people that say, I had somebody recently say to me, I used to sit and draw and draw and draw and I haven't picked up a colored pencil in 50 years. Who are you? And people haven't had the luxury to even think about this. So we can spend a lot of time on that. You know, I always meet my clients where they are. Sometimes they don't want to go that deep. But if they do, it's my favorite thing to do with them because what they come up with is remarkable and surprising to them. That's what's really fun. It's really surprising sometimes. It's um, it's almost kind of an element of that self-discovery, but you're not really discovering anything new. You're discovering things that may have got pushed down and how kind of, you know, over, over the period, you know, and I think it's, I talk about, you know, the second childhood element of what retirement is and the chance to be curious again. And think about how you felt as a 15, 16 year old, maybe even a little bit younger. Uh, think about how that felt and how free you were and the dis- kind of what, you know, what, what you did then. I think um, that that's, that's huge when someone starts to plan how they want to live their retirement. Because ultimately, again, if you, if we do think about this, there's a whole block of our life where um, generally you get a little bit more dictated to, you're at work, you're not, you know, the, the freedom isn't there. And for the first time that you've got this opportunity, and it might take quite a bit of work to dig back 30 to 40 years to feel like, oh, I used to feel like this, or, or you know, bring to the surface stuff that has just been maybe pushed down a lot over, over a really big period of time. I, I, I've got a sketch for this, and I try and work through this with people. I call it the challenge of who. And I think who is the right place to start, right? I, I think um, we, we want to start with, and I think of it in a three-dimensional way, Susan, it's kind of who, who we were, who we are now, and who we want to be. And when we try and explore those three elements, then I think we're in a good space to go, well, actually, what does retirement now look like? How best can I use those hard-earned savings to spend money and time on what's really important to me? And that's really foundational foundational stuff. That kind of, that, that who element is really important. I agree, and the sky's the limit. People can be completely different on the next phase of life. They don't have to be the same. If they had been a head down serious person, they can lighten up. They can choose a different way and and ingrain that in their in their new psyche. It's the sky's the limit. It can be very exciting. And I don't think people tend to have that, you know, the word retirement again, they don't have that schema in their head that it's going to be that they can be yeah. different. Yeah. So it, it's just exciting. I think I think retirement for many has has um, it has negative meaning as well mm-hmm. as positive meaning, right? And right. you know that that's why the word and and what's associated with it ca- can drive some some negative emotions. I think what's interesting for me is when we when we talked a couple of weeks ago, you know, re- retirement is obviously that you know this really significant transition that involves huge amounts of change, and that's where you spend all of your time. Um, and, and that can obviously be a scary time for many people. And I think that's why the retirement word has negative co- connotations. This is actually quite a scary moment in life. What the hell am I going to do with my time? Um, I'm just going to just get through this, right? Um, but when, when, when you and I talked, we talked about, well, actually, how can people not only survive, which is a basic foundational human instinct. So we, you know, human beings will always look to survive first, um, but more importantly, thrive during this thing. How can we shift this uh, rather scary, monumental transition and change that makes us feel a little bit uh, anxious? What to, to kind of understand? Well, here's the survival element, and actually now I'm going to go ahead and 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 thrive and 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 spark into life. 
you know what? I, I go back to the to the foundation. It's not not to quote a quote that's quoted too much, but Ben Franklin said it well: "By failing to prepare, you're preparing to fail." And this isn't a win lose or fail situation, but pre- preparation is everything, and really being thoughtful and mindful. And I hear, especially from my male clients, that it didn't enter their mind to go anywhere but to the numbers first, and they realize later, oh man, there was way more to this. But, you know, they've even said to me, well, guys kind of don't tend to talk, talk about stuff like that. So, so having this out there, even having it out, like you have it out in the ether and having more books, more people talking about this, you know, they prepare for that financial piece. And, um, and then the awareness, uh, excuse me. And then they, that's it. The buck stops there. So getting, going back to basics, working with a coach or working with somebody who will listen to them to go through some phases. There's, I know there's books out there on going through steps of a transition. And if they could really be mindful about it, it would, it would be fabulous. Um, And I think the thriving part comes with their attitude and really choosing their attitude in their next phase of life. We can choose how we, re- we, excuse me, we react to everything, right? And this is a choice. You want, you can be a downer about it. I know my dad was kind of a crabby dad growing up. And when he got let loose in retirement and just his grandkids, he turned into a pretty festive guy. So it's a choice. It's a choice. I think that is really interesting. There's loads of research about the, your attitude in later life. Um, your attitude as you age, and actually how that extends your life by quite significant um, years, like four to five to six years in different studies that you see, right? This kind of positive attitude towards living life in your 60s, 70s, and 80s, this positive attitude towards going, well, actually, I'm going to find new things that I need to do and and have a thrive mindset rather than just a survive uh, mindset. Um, so I think that that's such a, such an, you know, a really important takeaway for people listening. It's, it's within us to all have that positive attitude as we enter into that, that, um, that stage of life, which, uh, I think, I think it's so important. Um, I wanted, I want to touch on one point you mentioned about men, um, because, I think there is, and the research backs this up, and the real work that I do with people back, back backs this up as well. There is a real disparity between men and women when it comes to retirement. I think, on general, women tend to retire better than men because women seem to have better social networks and are better at making social connections and are better at change. Um, but but men often have you know and again we're not going to be stereotypical so, so much here but let's just say you know the, the person that's worked or the man that's worked and actually a massive part of their uh, life has been work which means a lot of their social connections are wrapped up in work and they might be quite surface level social connections and I think like you said men have trouble thinking well actually I need to now go and interact with new people and do I really want to do that and what does that mean and I'm leaving the work and how so do, do you see that a lot the, the difference between this the, the transition between men, men and women and how they adapt and how they, their attitudes are I do see that a lot the men tend to retire and expect their partner and their family to take care of uh, all their social life because that's the way it's been it's been that and exactly as you said their social life was at work and that was enough for them so encouraging men to go join meetups for, I don't know, do you have meetups in the UK? Mm-hmm. Yeah, to get them to join. I always recommend meetups. When I moved to a new area, I started looking at hiking meetups and sailing meetups. Um, it's a way to gr- join groups and meet people. That's way more like pulling teeth on men than it is women. And I don't, that's a, that's a deep rooted thing that isn't easy to change, but bringing it up to them it's, it's like a paradigm shift when you say, what do you think about, me? you know, looking on Meetup and seeing if there's hiking groups or golfing groups or what the kind of, you know, it's, it, I feel like I'm really, really telling them something they don't want to hear, but some will do it. Some will do it. Now there's even men's groups 
that are quite spiritual in nature that are growing here in California, at least. So, so some men are even doing that to get their bearings. So, you know, it's, we're evolving as a species. We're evolving in understanding that we're the, we're the ones who drive our life, right? As we just talked about. And some of them want, some of them will adapt and some don't. Another thing about the men and women, and this was a piece that I find really interesting, is that we have a whole different, and this could be a whole different podcast, situation with women, especially executive women. Now, when they're in their 50s and 60s, and I kind of hate to say this, I don't want to sound sour grapes, but as women are in their 50s and 60s, they're a bit ignored by society. Um, we're, we're, we don't feel as seen. And that's not to be paranoid. That's just kind of a fact. And it happens to old people in general. But women who were known for their career and they were executives and they walked in a room and everybody stopped talking and turned around. Now they're in their 60s and they're retiring and they go out in society and they're just not that important anymore. And they don't have that situation where the seas park for them when they walk in a room. It's a huge adjustment. So women and men have different issues in retirement. I mean, this could happen to men as well, of course, but women, they're so revered if they are high up, you know, in a, well, everybody is when they're VP level and above, but for women then to be in a society that kind of ignores them after they retire, it's rough. And it's something that we work through. I was thinking of, I was going to start a support group on it or a support group, but uh, kind of courses on it because it's, it's rough. My experience when talking with couples is that they they end up both assuming that one another are thinking the same thing, that it, it's a real challenge for them to kind of bring out their con- own concerns and their own challenges because, you know, it, it's the husband is is, uh, is thinking that the wife is thinking what he's thinking and the wife is kind of well it's it, so communication is so critical in 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 this in this point for for couples that um that, that have had different lives um i was talking today to, to someone about this going well you're moving from a, a situation where you've been apart for a big part of your life right so you know, yeah, you've come together at certain points, but you both might be working and you both might work different hours. And, you know, you but then you have the children potentially and, and and weekends, you might split yourselves a little bit around and all this stuff. And that's happened for such a prolonged period of time that you're then saying, oh, by the way, you're going to now spend all of your time together for the rest of your life. And that can be quite, da- if not talked about, that can be quite daunting for people. And that transition th- into that, if not thought about and planned for and talked about can lead to some real trouble in people, I think. Absolutely. I think I heard that the divorce rate is actually way up for people over 60, right? Yeah, it is. Well, I think that's the, you know, it depends. If you've had a pattern of not communicating about things your whole whole marriage, this is going to be a rough one. But if you could, you know, get it together and communicate and, um, you know, I like you have even heard of couples who have taken a weekend away to plan, talk about their expectations. I know for a fact with my parents, they didn't talk about their expectations. My dad's expectation was to sit and watch TV for the most part, do a little woodworking downstairs. My mom was looking forward to him retiring so she could finally travel. And I don't know how much they talked about it, but I'm guessing not because she was not happy about the level of travel. And she ended up going, you know, she, I don't know if she really knew that he said he was never going back to Europe because he was in the war. You know, he was not going back. So she went several times, but she went with friends and my sisters. My guess is because of their typical communication pattern that probably that conversation was not had. And she was frustrated a lot. You know, she had given her heart and soul raising eight kids and she did a good job. She kind of deserved to travel, you know, but he did go on some trips with her. And when I lived in Asia, he did go. So that was good. But those things need to be taught. The expectations, my gosh, it's, it's really a simple conversation. If you think about it, what do you want to do? (laughs) What are you expecting to do? What do you think you'll do with your days? Well, I want to sit, well, I want to hike the Camino. So I'm going to start planning with friends going on the Camino, you know, it's it's conversation. I think that the word that you said there is expectations is absolutely spot on. It, it's setting expectations and just simple kind of, well, what do you want to do? 
with your time. And the other word I think I, I like is assumptions because I see people assuming, as I said, the other one. And, and actually, most assumptions are false because it's your own inner beliefs that you're kind of then portraying onto someone else. Um, so I think when it comes to assuming what people want to do, we need to have conversations about, is my assumption on, on what I'm thinking true? And let me know what you're expecting. Just, just you know, and, and have that little conversation around it. It can be really transformational when it comes to com, comes to couples really thinking about how they're going to work together. Yeah, as the old saying goes, and as assuming makes an ass of you and me, right? Um, yeah, assume, assumptions most of the time are wrong and are the reason for most fights. <laughs> Yeah, no, um, absolutely. Yeah. You know, this is definitely an aspect of life of, of I, I actually created a retirement wheel. And um, actually, I offer it to, to people who are watching. They can look on my website and download it. It's a retirement wheel that can help people visualize all the pieces because it's not just the financial piece, as we have so declared here. There's so many aspects of life. So um, I really urge people, you asked me about how I get people to you know, think a little differently or look at things differently. And it's really about going deep inside and, and thinking about things with your heart. And I do get a little woo on this, but I think it's time for some woo and some introspection when you're looking at such a big life transition. So, I mean, I keep in mind, everybody is different. Everybody wants something different. So I approach people all different ways and there's no, there's no formula, but on this wheel, it really helps if you look at each piece and I can explain each piece. So um, there's the spiritual piece. I kind of slash spiritual self time. So whatever that is to you, how are you in your spiritual piece? And will you give yourself time for that piece? You know, with me, it's meditation. I love going on retreats. I love silent retreats. I love all learning retreats. I love it all. So what is it for you? Is it your religion? Is it your faith? What? Is it and how are you going to keep it in your life and forefront of your life? Um, my wheel has, I think, eight, eight, eight sections. One is, and this is typical of a wheel of life, but a little different, a different time in your life. So family and friends. Um, I love that longitudinal study by, by Waldinger the good, and his book, The Good Life. Really worth reading. The Harvard study, um, I mean, it, as it, it proved that people who live um, happy, long, fulfilling lives had a really strong social connection and strong social life. So if family and friends have been somewhat neglected during your, during your tenure of work for the last 40 years, what are you going to do to build that up? You have a responsibility there to build it up for yourself and make it robust because it's so huge. So another part of that wheel is partnership and love. This is a big one, as we just discussed. So what are you going to do to have that conversation? This will evolve greatly with retirement. You can't pretend it's not going to. I mean, everybody has a different situation. Somebody might reti be retiring, going home to somebody that's already retired or going home to somebody who's not home yet because they haven't retired. So what's that conversation? If the other person hasn't retired, do they have any idea when they will? So how can you make maybe a new vow even to honor and be to be patient with one another, to honor one another's new phase of life because it's so new. It's like when you had a kid back in the day, everything changed and it's worth a talk. It's worth a talk. So another part of that wheel is health and fitness. And you know, I love this topic since I was I'm a former gym owner and personal trainer and I love to move myself. So I'm a hiker, I'm a yogi, um, dying to get on the Camino. I haven't done that yet. But um, nobody can tell me they're too old. I love when people try that one on me. When I had the fitness studio, I had Mary. Mary, I had her from the time she was 93 to 97. She came to my studio. She had been going there for years. And all I can say is that neurons that fire together, wire together, because 
she would come, she would take the summer off because she went back to New York. And when she would come back to California in October, she's, I, you know, she didn't have a gym there. Not many people take a 93 year old in a gym, but I, no. she was my, <laughs> she was my love. I loved when Mary walked in the door and she walked ramrod straight and she knew how to work out because she'd been a physical therapist. So she was just cool. And she would um, come back in in October and she'd say, oh, you know, I haven't been to, haven't been working out. I can't even remember what she called it. I think it was a funny name. But she would stand there and start with her balance. She'd hold on to a bar and lift a leg and lift another leg and lift a leg. And uh, she was just a riot. She was the first she was the first one who said to me, you know, I'm, I'm going to slide in home base. I'm going to get out of this life all worn out and I'm going to be bruised and battered. But I think I learned later that was Mae West that said that. Yeah. So the, the health and fitness piece of it, something you've neglected, which so many people do during their busy, busy executive lives, do something to get it back. And I love making that fun for people. And I love making it something that's tailored to them because everybody likes something different. I used to have people at the gym that just hated certain things and, they look at me with a panic on their face. I hate to run. And I'd say, that's okay. We don't have to run. There's many ways to, uh, to get people out and moving. And uh, another part of that wheel is fun play and travel. And one thing I like to ask people, we talked about this earlier. Well, we did talk about this is what did you like to play when you're a child? And not only what did you like to play, but what did that feel like? Because when somebody asked me this question not too long ago, the only thing I could picture, because I, I did a lot of dumb things I'm not going to do now, like playing ding dong ditch, playing tag in the street, and making mud pies. I'm not going to do that. But the way I felt, I used to spin around, skip. And when somebody asked me that question, I thought about it. It was more the feeling I went to and just the feeling of lightness and sheer carefree. So I actually went online and bought a hula hoop. <laughs> I thought, I'm going to so hula cool. hoop. And what's yeah. funny is uh, at my gym, we had hula hoops. And, you know, I specialized in boomers and their parents. So people would walk in and I would hand them a hula hoop. And they first they'd look at me, look at it and me like I was out of my mind. Then they would take it, get this huge grin on their face. Like you cannot look at a hula hoop without smiling and you can't try it without smiling. So it's about the fun. It's about bringing fun and lightness back in your life. And maybe, maybe that's me. I'm I, all I ever want to do is have fun, but I'm going to, I'm going to get my clients to do it too. So another part of that wheel is curiosity and learning, remaining curious is everything. We don't want to be boring old people. Um, I'll tell you, my number one thing for curiosity, learning, growth is podcasts. That's how I found you. I freaking love podcasts. I can learn anything on a podcast. I'm a podcast and YouTube junkie. And I spend a lot of time hiking my mountain, which is right there. And it's always a podcast. Always. I never have, I don't have a lot of idle time where I'm not learning something. It's just fun. So I follow thought leaders and um, I just feel so lucky that that's at our fingertips now. We don't have to go to the library to learn. We just pop it in. You know, I like to plug, um, I like to plug MEA here. It's, uh, have you heard of the Modern Elder Academy? Uh, I have. Yeah. Is that uh, Chip? Yeah, that's Chip. He just put out the book, Learning to Love Midlife. That's a fun one. I mean, it's a, it's called, it's a midlife wisdom school. I'm a part of the alumni now because I've gone to one of their courses down in Baja and had done one of their online courses. Fabulous and fabulous about, about being around like-minded people who are going into this next phase of life with that curiosity mindset and just a sense of fun and wonder. It's what it's all about. Hi everyone, Dan here. I just wanted to jump in real quick to say that if you are thinking about or unsure where to start with your retirement plans, then I've put together what I believe to be one of the best free resources for you. My retirement toolkit is packed with videos, guides, webinars, worksheets, blogs, and podcast episodes, and is completely free to download. Just go to the show notes where you will find the link. Now, let's get back to the show. 
thank you so much for sharing your, your thoughts about that retirement wheel and I'll I'll make sure that the links are all all on that to do that and that I agree with you about the book the good life and all that it's just, just absolutely brilliant um I I want to I want to go to um just to kind of on this same topic right we we talked about assumptions being dangerous um I think one of, one of the problems I see is that many people see retirement as kind of like the finish line, like the end game, like the holy grail, the thing that I've been working for 30 years has come about, like all my problems will be solved when I retire, right? That's kind of what they hear, it's the finish line. Um, what, why is that a dangerous assumption to make? And, and why must we view retirement as that start line and, and, and new beginning? Mm, I love that question, Dan. I think the finish line is when you're dead. So I, I wouldn't call it the finish line. Um, I see that a lot. And I saw it in a friend recently and um, it didn't turn out that way real fast, which is a bummer. But people think retirement is their panacea, right? That they're going to retire and all of a sudden life isn't going to be life. There's going to be butterflies and songbirds and, and no problems whatsoever, but they need to understand that life is still life. It still has its ups and downs and its wins and losses and all of the nuance. Also, you know, best laid plans, we talked about that. You know, maybe the plans you made that you're so solid about, so sure you're going to, you know, do were didn't end up floating your boat. So maybe you're done traveling. Now what? You know, perhaps taking care of the grandkids wasn't all it was meant to be. So, you know, that's all okay. We, in, we, we reinvented, if you think about it, there is no fail. We reinvented throughout our professional life. There's no absolute rules for retirement. So we can, reinvent our, we can reinvent our retirement as much as we want. So, you know, eh, hit the reset button. It's important that people understand that there's no one way and there's no one set in stone. But, you know... They want to, they, now I forget your original question that I said was a good question. Um, I just think they have to realize life is still life. <laughs> You're still going to have your, your adult kids that are going to do wonky things and whatnot. Life is life. Um, and you can roll with it and your plans might get skewed and you can reset. And what's the worst that can happen? Get fired? <laughs> yeah. I think one of the the challenges I see around that is that the, if you see it as the finish line where you are, you know, it, it, it's the, if you build something up too much, it's always going to disappoint you in my experience, right? It's a bit like they say, never meet your heroes, never meet your favorite sports stars. That, that it's kind of, you know, they don't, it's don't meet you, you know, don't meet your heroes, that kind of thing. If, 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 if people build something up too much as this thing, this thing that's going to impact everything, then I think it's, you're only setting it up to disappoint. And I think that's why, it, it, you know, seeing it as the panacea, the Holy Grail is a really, a really dangerous assumption to make, see it as a new phase of life and a, a new beginning and, and, and put some work into it, right? Like, like any transition, like any new moment, when you think about new career, whether you've had children, moved house, all these other little transitions you've done, they require work and time in order for us to feel like that, you know, that we've put the work behind the scenes to do it. It, it, it brings me on to that, um, I think, which, which you and I have uh, spent a lot of time looking at uh, the brilliant William Bridges and his, and his kind of transition uh, model that he has. Um, I, and I'd love for you, because I know you, you, you use this a lot and you think about the, the, this a lot when it comes to this. And it's a wonderful model. Explain to me the, the, the phases of a positive uh, transition and why they're so important for people to understand and to think about and to plan with. Well, um, the work of William Bridges is just instrumental in what I do. The, um, you know, retirement's a huge transition in life. And he wrote the books on books, a couple books on transition. And like many a big life changes, it needs some forethought on many levels and some respect on many levels, social, psychological, physical, you know, all well-being levels. So if we look into transitions theory, um, very simplistically, it states that there's an end 
that prompts your transition. I remember just thinking that was interesting. I thought, oh, no transition in life happens without something having ended first. So when you're looking through a new beginning, like retirement, it's because of the ending that happened that prompted it, which is stop and work. So there's what what William Bridges called the messy middle. Um, so first there's the ending, then there's the messy middle, which I actually like to rename the miraculous middle. Um, I think I'm a bit of a Pollyanna, but messy, yes, but it's also miraculous. It's where everything happens. It's all the transformation and growth and you're trying new things. You're learning what you want as well as what you don't necessarily want to do. You're choosing some things, dumping others. There's wins and then there's setbacks. The middle just goes in a zigzag fashion. I like to say it's your zigzag, your zigzag, uh, transformational space. There's so much and it's so beefy. And when people are in that phase of trying to figure things out, they get down on themselves. I say, but as long as you're stepping one little step in any direction, things are happening. It might not happen fast. It definitely won't be linear, but there's that middle space where we want to really give ourselves some grace and, and be kind to ourselves. So thinking of life transition as an ending a miraculous and very busy middle. And then the new beginning is when you stop work, but then that keeps being transformed, which is really fun. So, um, I mean, I could go more deeply into that. Um, when one thing I recommend and people don't always think this, this is a paradigm shift for them. And I feel this with all transitions, even when you lose somebody that you love very much really take a solid look and mourn if you have to mourn the ending or just honor the ending. Um, people don't think of patting themselves on the back for a career well done. I mean, love yourself for all that hard work. Uh, have gratitude for yourself for what you've accomplished. I mean, they had to go through crazy amounts of work and stress to get through a big career. I have people write themselves a letter of thanks for all their hard work if they're so inclined. Um, just sit down and write, write themselves a letter and uh, write all their major accomplishments. Or, you know, if that's not their thing, they're more of a linear thinker, write all your major accomplishments, all of them you can think of from each job. Or if they're too humble for even that, how about write down all the people they feel they influenced along the way? That's a fun one. How many good leaders did you create? How many people said, thank you so much for saying that to me. Thank you so much for that training. You saved my life. You know, there's so many wins along the way. Counting all those wins is just wonderful. So, you know, it's a, it's a rite of passage. And I know when I left my last job, I wasn't going to do anything huge and I wasn't sad about it, but I, um, I actually just thought I would take a day and I hiked 10 miles. I just wanted to put 10 miles on my on my hill. Um, I have a friend who was forced into retirement. He went and hiked the Camino for three months. You know, there's so many things you can do to commemorate. I even knew somebody that had a Star Wars party because when Star Wars come out in 77 or 79, and that was the year they started their career. So they had a Star Wars party. So people can be creative. It doesn't have to be expensive. It could be a big trip, but it doesn't have to be. So something to really commemorate and kind of put a period on that and move on. Then we move into the messy middle or the miraculous middle. See, now I'm saying it. So, so much in the, in the miraculous middle, there's so much growth and it's really a fun time to work with people. One of the things I think that definitely happens for me is that they, this, they end up doing this too late. It's kind of that the retirement, the retirement thing happens and then they do step one, and then they do step two, and then it's like it's, well, actually, no, as you as you rightly said, you know, the new beginning is the is the is the day you retire and, and go. So, I think that my, my takeaway from that, and what I want to try and get across to the listeners here, is that this is a multi year planning thing to transition properly that requires you to understand what the ending looks like, understand what letting go looks like, understand the emotions that that will give you. Maybe, as you said, gradually let go of these things over a period of years. So it's not a kind of a massive hit um, or, or, or on one particular day or week. Think about that, you know, and, and live the messy middle 
before you get, you know, you don't, you don't want to be in that messy middle stage having retired already because you're going to have to go through a series of motions of what that looks like. And then you hit that end date. So I think it's, um, it's really important to give time and grace to this planning process. I, I heard uh, last year sometime that, um, that anecdotal quotes out there that people spend more time planning a two week holiday vacation than they do uh, planning a 30 to 40 year retirement, right? That's kind of like, it's, 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 it's mad, you know, you, you're planning a massive stage of life. So you need to put some work and do some do some heavy lifting. That's very true, but also there. If I look at it, is there is not no wrong way. I had somebody no, reach out to me no, re- recently yeah. who had been a year retired, and now they're now they're thinking, "Oh my gosh, I never planned this. What am I doing?" That's also a fun time to. T- we can go all the way back to the beginning and take do some purpose work and really take a look at who they are. And it's sometimes a fun time for them to do it because they are relaxed now. They, and I try to get them not to be um, down on themselves about taking a while. You don't have to be down on yourselves. There's no right or wrong. There's no right, right path. And I think, like you said, with men, they tend to wait until after they've been out a couple of years to really process it. Um, so, so there is no proper per se. And I'm not sure, you know, it almost reminds me of, and I, I don't know if this is the best analogy, but I remember when my mom was dying of cancer, we thought we were mourning ahead of time. Eh, you don't really, you can't because you really can't know what it's like until that person goes. And that's kind of a rough analogy for it, but it's kind of like retirement. They don't think there's anything to plan for other than financial. And they're very proud of that until they live it. So it's okay if the cart becomes before the horse. Um, It's a fun, it's actually a fun time to grab them and see what they've been doing, see what's worked, what hasn't worked. Talk to somebody more recently that Everything's worked. They're just now bored and want to that reset, yeah. that re, recalibration, yeah, yeah. yeah repurpose. I, it's, yeah, it's actually it's a really, really valid and interesting point. You know, in an idealistic world, you you spend a couple of years planning it and doing all this stuff, but. Um, you know, as you said, everyone's unique and everyone does things their own way. And these models are, you know, these models are useful, um, but but they can be applied in different ways and different versions um, at different at different stages. But I think what you said there is really interesting in that you, um, you know, pe- people people are unique in this journey, and. We need to allow them to feel like, I, I, I suppose, no, you, you know, retirement is something that you you don't know what it's like until you're doing it, until you live it. It's one of those things that you just have no idea. There is no, you know, as many as many books have been written about it, there is no really one manual. It's a bit like bringing up a kid, right? I mean, there's no manual for this as such. Um, so it's it's difficult to plan for retirement you know, and I say that actually what one of the faults I see in retirement planning is too many people treat retirement like a complicated problem that can be solved by numbers and solutions and plans, right? That's but it a can't. Great retirement point. is mm-hmm. retirement is a complex problem that actually probably can never be solved and and requires consistent adaptation, change, and everything. Um, because we just don't know what it's like until we're living in it. And I think that's, everybody needs permission to know that it's okay to not know what this looks like. It's okay to change plans. It's okay, because we just don't know. As long as we have a, I think as we started this conversation with some foundational stuff, that kind of purpose and meaning. I think as long as those foundational stuffs are in there, why do you want to pull back the duvet? Who do you want to be? Who are you trying to be? Then everything else is just a journey, right? And and who knows how you get there, but um, you need some guidance and and some understanding about that that the plans are just wrong because it you know because they're just never going to be lived because we don't know what the future holds. Right, like you say, that goal setting goals are made to be broken, right? And and life changes too much. You know, your kids are are growing. They're having kids. Those kids are growing. You might be needed. They're so it time to be malleable, time to be malleable. And you never know if that hate to say it, but I need it's acting up. What's that going to bring me down the line? I've got to be patient. 
and having that grace with ourselves, having that grace is just so important. I don't, I do feel like in Western society, we tend to beat ourselves to a pulp about everything. And if we're not perfect in everything, we really beat ourselves up. And I would love, that's a whole different topic is people realizing that they're just all pretty cool and to, to learn to love themselves. That would be a great thing to do in retirement. Susan, I think that's a wonderful place for us to try, kind of wrap this up. Cause I think that, I mean, that is quite a foundational statement. Um, and yeah, I, I would encourage people to rewind that last 30 seconds. Cause I think that that's, that's so, so important. That is the foundation of a long, happy retirement. Um, Susan, where can people find you? And you're obviously going to be very gracious with your retirement wheel, which I think is amazing. And I'll put the show, put it in the show notes, put your um, website in the show notes. Um, but but um, yeah, people can find you. You've got a great website. You do a lot of coaching with 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 people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I'm on LinkedIn, Suzanne Campy, just S U Z A N N E C A M P I. And um, also SuzanneCampyCoaching.com. It's a bit of a mouthful. So check out my website. I do offer that wheel for folks and also a 30 minute consultation if there's any, if you'd like to have a chat. And um, yeah, and then follow me on LinkedIn as well, as well as connecting with me. Please do follow me and uh, I'll keep you posted on my upcoming web- webinar. Fantastic. Well, Susan, thank you for taking such, you know, a big amount of time out of your day to join me. It's been such a great conversation um, and I've loved everything you've said and thank you for the work that you do. Um, And yeah, I know how transformation is for people. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for the work you do, Dan. I love that you're getting this out there to, to the world and to your peers. I really do. Appreciate that so much. Um, And that just leaves me to thank everyone once again for joining us for another episode of the Humans vs. Retirement podcast. Until next time, take care. Thanks for tuning in to the Humans vs. Retirement podcast. I hope this show will arm you with insights, strategies, and a newfound excitement for navigating life beyond the nine to five grind. Remember, retirement isn't just an endpoint. It's a vibrant chapter brimming with opportunities for growth, adventure, and purpose. Keep exploring, stay curious, and embrace the next phase of your life with enthusiasm. Until next time, may your retirement dreams continue to flourish and inspire.